Chapter 9 Esther hated watching Harriet go, but she was thrilled her friend was moving on with her life and not staying locked in her house in Beckham any longer. She hugged Harriet tightly outside the train station. I'm going to miss you, but I'm so glad you're getting married. Harriet laughed. I'm getting married as long as he'll still have me with as late as I've been. Esther shook his head. He's going to take one look at you and know that no other woman could ever compare. I certainly hope so. They hugged one last time before Harriet headed for the train. She truly hoped her friend's second marriage was better than her first. While they were in town, Thomas took her to the mercantile and let her choose from the small display of guns they had. She gripped several in her hands, before choosing a six-shooter. This one. She handed it to Thomas, who looked it over and then bought ammunition. He bought enough for her to practice with and still have some left over for protection. If they needed more, he'd have the next person to go into town buy it for them. By the time they arrived home, it was too late to practice, but as soon as she'd finished the breakfast dishes the following morning, he had her outside in front of a small target he'd made. From that day forward they spent an hour every morning in target practice before he went out to the fields and she began her work. It was mid-December before he declared her a good shot and let her stop practicing daily. She wasn't sure if he really felt she was good enough or if he was worried about how huge she was as she tried to shoot. When it was his turn to go to town, he dropped her off at Victoria's house so she wouldn't be alone. She's too close to her time to make the drive comfortably, he explained. And I don't want her home alone all day while I'm gone. Victoria smiled at Esther. We'll be just fine. Esther spent the day sitting in a rocking chair and being waited on by Victoria and Marianne while the other children played inside. It was too cold out for them to spend a long time outside. Esther knitted a scarf and hat for Thomas for Christmas while she Saturday, I hope this baby comes soon, Esther sighed. Victoria smiled. I don't think you have much longer. Probably just another month at most. Good. I don't think I can handle much longer than that. It's getting hard to move around. I know. The last month is always the hardest. Do you need Marianne to come stay with you? Esther shook her head. She'd have loved the help, but she wanted to remain active. She also didn't want the girl to be in any danger by being in her house when Charlie's mother arrived. She didn't think Mrs. Perry would hurt a child, but she hadn't expected her to slap her either. No, but thank you. It was already dark by the time Thomas got back from the city. They ate the dinner Victoria had prepared before they headed back to their own homestead. She was relieved to be able to climb into the wagon next to Thomas for the short drive home. Are you tired? he asked kindly. Exhausted. There was something in the back of the wagon covered by a sheet, but she didn't ask what it was. She knew he was planning a special surprise for Christmas, and she wouldn't try to ruin it. She'd finished the scarf and hat for him and had it tucked into her coat so he wouldn't see it. She was excited about their first Christmas together, and the baby following soon. They still watched warily for any intruders, but so far everything had been fine. The next day was Christmas Eve and other than the chores that had to be done, they were both planning on spending their day together. She would cook and clean up after the meals, and he would milk the cows, but for the most part, they could spend the whole day together. Esther woke early to make him his favorite breakfast of pancakes, eggs and bacon. She rarely made all three things but felt like a Christmas indulgence was in order. They'd spend Christmas Eve alone and exchange gifts before bed, and then go to his brother's house the following morning for the day, spending it with the children. They'd work together to come up with gifts for his nieces and nephews, and Esther was excited to be able to share them. After breakfast, they spent the day quietly talking and making plans for their future. Esther was close enough to delivering that almost everything was painful for her, her back aching constantly. When it came time for lunch, he made them both sandwiches and served her in her rocking chair. What were your Christmas traditions at home, he asked as they ate their simple meal. She shrugged. Her traditions had seemed so normal to her that it was hard to answer. 
We would wake early to presents in our Christmas stockings, and then gather around in the dining room, which was the only room big enough for all of us, and we would open our presents from each other. What would you get in your stockings? She smiled. We usually each got a penny and an orange, and then Mama would give us each something that was suited to use personally. The boys would get tiny soldiers or train engines carved from wood by our father, and we girls would get pretty handkerchiefs with tatted lace on the outside. Two years ago Charlie gave Mama a small pendant to put in my stocking for me. She was wearing the pendant and traced it with her index finger. The motion wasn't lost on Thomas and he sighed, realizing he'd never have her love the way Charlie did. It's pretty. She nodded. We had just become engaged, but were waiting until the following December to marry, so it was special to me. It matched my engagement ring. His eyes went to her finger and he realized he'd never seen her wear a ring other than the one he'd put on her finger. Where's your engagement ring? Her eyes met his. I had to sell it before I left Beckham. There just wasn't enough money from the eggs I sold, so I sold the ring and the horse who killed Charlie for the things I needed. I'm sorry. Thomas was surprised that he was sorry she'd had to sell the ring. It would have been special to her. I'm glad you kept the pendant. For some reason this was always more special to me anyway. The ring was something he felt like he had to give me, but this pendant was something he saw and it made him think of me. That made it so much more special. Would you rather wait and open presents on Christmas morning, he asked, not wanting to mess up her normal Christmas traditions? She shook her head. Christmas morning is for children. We don't have any. I'd rather open our presents for each other tonight, and then tomorrow morning, watch as your nephews and nieces open theirs. Okay. I just want your Christmas to be perfect. She smiled and took his hand. My Christmas will be perfect because I'm with you. You make every day very special. He stared at her, a lump forming in his throat. Did she really feel that way, or was she just saying it to make him feel better? Surely she knew he loved her, but he'd never had the courage to say the words. What would she do if he said them, then? He brought her fingers to his lips, but didn't say the words. How could he? She was too pretty to love a man like him. He was just glad that she was so affectionate toward him. When they opened their presents that evening, her eyes grew wide at the shelf he'd built. She'd expected a gift for the baby, but instead, he'd made her a shelf to keep books and special mementos on. It was a corner shelf that would go perfectly in their main room. Tears sprang to her eyes as she touched it. She gave him his gift, a new scarf and hat for the cold winter months when he was checking on his wheat. He pulled them on and exclaimed over how much he loved them and how warm they'd keep him. It's the perfect gift for a farmer growing winter wheat. He glanced at her, sitting in her rocking chair. Wait right there now. I have one more gift. But I only got you one, she protested. His brown eyes twinkled as he headed for the door. That's okay. Wait. She sat waiting patiently for the second gift whatever it was. She couldn't imagine what else he would get her after the beautiful shelf. They didn't need any more furniture, but if he kept it in the barn, that's what it must be. Her brow furrowed as she tried to guess. The door opened and he brought in a huge package wrapped in brown paper with a pretty red ribbon tying it on tightly. He brought it to her and set it on the floor at her feet. She smiled up at him as she carefully untied the pretty red bow, folding the paper as she removed it, automatically thinking about how she could use it. Under the paper was a rocking horse, complete with a mane and tail made of yarn. He'd used the stain he'd told her he had left over from the rocking chairs and her hand stroked over the beautiful wood. It's perfect. Her eyes met his and she had tears in hers. Thank you. It wasn't supposed to make you cry. She sniffled. It just means so much to me that you've accepted the baby as your own. He knelt beside her holding her hand in his. How could I not accept the baby as my own when I love its mother so much? Her eyes met his and the tears flowed faster. 
Do you mean it? He nodded. He hadn't meant to tell her, but he meant it with all his heart. I wouldn't have said it if I didn't mean it. Her face lit up. I love you, too. So much. He shook his head. You can't love me. You're much too pretty to love a man like me. She shook her head violently. I do love you. I've known it for a long time. At first, I felt guilty for loving you, like I was betraying Charlie somehow, but then I realized that Charlie would have wanted me to find love again. He would have wanted his baby to grow up with a father who loved him. You're giving him everything he would have wanted for me and our child by taking us in and loving us. Thomas stared into her eyes. You mean it, don't you? She nodded. Of course I mean it. How could I not love you? You're a good, loving man. I'm so happy I answered your advertisement and decided to spend forever with you. He gathered her close, feeling an outpouring of love for her. How could someone so precious love him? He wasn't sure, but he could only hope she never stopped. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Christmas with Samuel and Victoria's family was an adventure. The children were thrilled with every single gift they received. Thomas had made a set of ten tiny little soldiers for each of the four boys, painting them red, green, yellow, and blue so the boys would be able to tell them apart. Esther gave each of the girls drawstring purses with handkerchiefs she'd carefully tatted lace for. Victoria had made each of them a new coat, and Samuel had given each child a shiny nickel to spend however they pleased. Being able to give each child that much was a mark of how well the harvest had gone for them that year. For Esther, Victoria had knitted a special shawl to use while she nursed the baby at church to make it easier for her to do it while staying concealed. She had made Thomas a set of gloves matching the hat and scarf Esther had made him. The two women had worked out the gifts more than a month before. Samuel had made Esther a small box to put the baby's keepsakes into. Victoria had a similar box for each of her children that included things like the first pair of shoes each child had worn and the first dress for the girls and first outfit for the boys. Each of their baby teeth was included in the box. Esther smiled and thanked them both, treasuring the special things they'd made for her child. Victoria had fixed a huge turkey dinner with all of the trimmings for their meal including mashed potatoes, a special sage dressing that her mother had taught her to make, dinner rolls and gravy. Esther thanked her profusely for all her work to make a special meal. I'm not certain I could have done it this late in my pregnancy. She'd made an apple pie but that was her only contribution for the meal. Victoria had waved away her thanks. I'm sure there will be a time when you'll need to be the one fixing special meals, and I know you'll do it with a smile. After dinner the children played with their new toys, including a toboggan Samuel had made for them. Because the prairie was flat, the two men took turns pulling the children around, and the women watched from the window, enjoying the sounds of the high-pitched squeals. I'm getting nervous about the birth, Esther admitted to her friend. I'd be surprised if you weren't, this being your first pregnancy and all. Victoria smiled over her shoulder from where she was washing dishes and Marianne was drying them. Esther had tried to help, but they'd insisted she sit and rest to save her strength. I'd attended 15 births before Marianne was born, and I was shaking like a leaf in my last month. It's strange that I'm so nervous about it, but so anxious for it to be over at the same time. I think I'm losing my mind. It makes sense, though. You're nervous because you've never done it before so it's an unknown, but you want it to be over because you're so uncomfortable in the last month. It'll be here soon, and then you'll have a sweet baby to hold in your arms. Victoria methodically washed the dishes handing them to Marianne one by one. I'm sending Marianne home with you today. Esther was surprised. Why? Victoria smiled. I've arranged it with Thomas. I want her to be with you until your time comes. That way if you go into labor while Thomas is in the field, she can come and get me. We don't want you to try to deliver on your own. Esther bit her lip, understanding the reasoning but hating the idea of taking Marianne from her mother for so long. 
It could still be a month before I deliver a though. I don't want her to have to stay with us for so long. Victoria shook her head. I don't think so. I'm going to examine you before you leave, but I really think you'll deliver within the week. I think it's time. The baby has already dropped. Esther nodded, conceding. She was having a hard time getting the most basic chores done, and she knew that having Marianne with her would help her. If you can spare her, she'd be a great help to me. Marianne smiled over her shoulder at Esther as she put the last dish on the shelves over the work table. I'd love to come and help you, Aunt Esther. Marianne had turned 11 during the time Esther was there, and she seemed to have become more mature before Esther's very eyes. Well, I wish I'd known. I'd have changed the sheets in the nursery and gotten it all ready for you. Victoria laughed softly. That's why we didn't tell you. We didn't want you to do any extra work. Marianne will change the sheets when she gets there. Before they left for the day, Victoria examined Esther, and when she was finished, she nodded. I was right. I'll be surprised if you go another week. You're already starting to dilate. Esther smiled as she sat up. I don't know if that makes me happy or nervous. Victoria slipped her arm around Esther's shoulders. I don't know how it should make you feel either. I just know that we'll be ready for it to happen when it's time. She led Esther out to the main room where Thomas was talking to Samuel and the children were playing around them. Marianne sat at the table with her small satchel by her side. Here's how I want things to go. When your pains start, I want you to send Marianne to Thomas, and then she'll come back to you to stay with you. First babies usually come very slowly, but she's assisted me in several births already and she can help you if it comes fast for any reason. Thomas will come get me. Esther nodded, taking a deep breath. I think that sounds like a good plan. She looked at Thomas. Do you think you'll be able to go for Victoria? Or will you get too nervous and ride your horse into a tree? Thomas laughed. You never know. Marianne picked up her satchel and walked out the door with them. Esther hugged her sister-in-law. I'll be seeing you soon. The three of them went back to the homestead with Marianne sitting in the middle. Once they were back, Thomas milked the cows and Marianne went inside with Esther. Ma sent leftovers so we don't have to cook tonight. She sent some turkey and gravy and said we could have turkey sandwiches. That sounds good. Esther set the table while Marianne made a fire and started heating up the turkey and gravy. By the time Thomas finished unhitching the horses and milking the cows, dinner was ready. They ate their meal, talking about the fun day they'd had. Marianne had the glow about her that all children seem to have on Christmas. She did the dishes, refusing to let Esther help, and then excused herself to go to bed. Her mother had sent her schoolwork with her to do every evening, and she wanted to get started. Thomas pulled Esther onto his lap after Marianne went up the stairs. Did you have a good day? Esther nodded, snuggling close to him. I did. It was the best Christmas I've ever had. He stared down at her stunned. Better than last year when you were married to Charlie? She let out a short laugh. We spent the day with my in-laws, and my mother-in-law told me everything that was wrong with me and why I wasn't good enough to be married to her son. Repeatedly. He stroked her hair. I don't know if you'll ever get to meet my mother, but she'd love you. Why do you say that? Because I do. She sighed contentedly and buried her face in his neck. I'm too heavy to sit on your lap, but I like it too much to get up. He laughed. You're not too heavy. He put his hand on her burgeoning stomach, stroking his hand over the baby. He's being quiet tonight. He has been for the last few hours. I think he's saving up all his energy for his arrival, or to kick me all night long so I can't sleep. I'm not sure which. He seems to be a stubborn little thing, so I'll say it's to kick you all night while you're trying to sleep. She smiled into his neck. Probably. She sat for a moment, just enjoying his closeness. 
I'm so tired. I don't know why because I haven't done anything today, but I need to go to bed. You're sleeping for two now. She struggled to her feet, her hand automatically going to her lower back to help her support the baby. You say that about everything. I'm eating for two, sleeping for two, walking for two. He shrugged. You are. Do you need me to carry you up? No, I don't want you to hurt yourself. She walked up the stairs slowly, taking each step carefully, because she'd been a little off balance for the past month. She stripped off her dress and put on a nightgown before slowly lowering herself to the mattress. He would have laughed if she hadn't looked so miserable. Thomas quickly stripped and pulled her back against him, his front to her back. It was the only way she felt comfortable sleeping, and he was happy to accommodate her. She nestled back against him and sighed. You really do make my back feel better when we lie this way. He stroked her hair. Go to sleep. You need your rest. She nodded, her eyes already drifting closed. Chapter 10 Esther woke while it was still dark to a pain in the small of her back. She moaned softly, reaching behind her. Careful to not wake Thomas, she struggled to sit up on the side of the bed, and got to her feet. As soon as she stood, she felt the liquid pouring down her legs. For a moment, she thought she'd wet herself, and then she realized her water had broken. She got a towel and cleaned the floor before changing to a clean nightgown. Once she was clean, she reached for Thomas's arm, gently shaking him awake. He looked up at her by the light of the full moon and sat up straight in bed. Is it time? She nodded. I don't think we're in a hurry. My water just broke. He jumped up and tugged his pants on over his nightshirt, tucking it into his pants. I'll go saddle the horse and get Victoria. She smiled as she watched him rush down the stairs. She went to get the cotton and old newspapers she'd bought and covered the mattress, stopping when she needed to as the pains came. She didn't bother waking Marianne, because there was no need. When Victoria came running up the stairs, she was sitting on the edge of her bed, reading a book she'd purchased the last time she'd gone to town with Thomas. She'd saved it for her labor time, knowing it would help keep her mind off the pain. How are you feeling? Victoria asked her eyes sweeping the room and looking at how neatly the bed was made up and prepared for the delivery. I'm doing well. My water broke, so I sent Thomas for you, but the pains are still quite a ways apart. Have you been timing them? Esther shook her head. I think they're about five minutes apart, though. We'll start timing them now. Victoria sat down on the edge of the bed and took her pocket watch out of her bag she took to every delivery with her. You didn't wake Marianne? No, there was no need yet. If the pains had been closer, I would have. Victoria removed her stethoscope and listened to the baby's heartbeat. He's still going strong in there. Esther nodded. I can tell. She smiled at her sister-in-law, surprised that she was no longer afraid of what would happen. She knew she was in good hands, and she was ready to let nature take its course. When the next pain started, Victoria noted the time so she could keep track of the time in between. Go ahead and lie down so I can check and see how dilated you are. Esther moved down to the position Victoria wanted her in and closed her eyes while Victoria checked her. Well. Hours yet, right? Victoria removed her hand and shook her head. You're almost there. Are you sure your water just broke? Esther nodded. Yes. When it broke, I cleaned up the mess and changed nightgowns and then I woke Thomas to come get you. She stopped for a moment as another pain gripped her. Victoria checked the time. Only a minute and a half apart. She stood. Excuse me. I'm going to wake Marianne. She came back with Marianne in her nightgown. It was less than 45 minutes later that Victoria laid a tiny baby girl on Esther's chest. Esther was laughing and crying at the same time. She counted the baby's ten little fingers and ten toes. Her eyes met Victoria's. She's so beautiful. 
Victoria smiled, her eyes pricking with tears. She is. Do you have a name for her yet? Victoria worked as she talked, cleaning up the last of the mess. It was just past dawn. Esther stared at her, startled. We hadn't talked about a girl's name. I was so certain it was a boy. Victoria laughed. You need to come up with one. We can't call her baby girl forever. She rolled up the last of the cotton batting in the newspaper to be thrown away. Are you ready for Thomas? Esther nodded. I hope he's not disappointed that it's a girl. He's going to be so thrilled to be a daddy that nothing else is going to matter to him. She waved Marianne out of the room to run and get her uncle. She sat on the edge of the bed, cooing to the baby until Thomas walked in. I'll leave you alone with your family. Esther stared at Thomas. Did Marianne tell you? When Thomas shook his head, she said, it's a girl. Are you disappointed? Thomas stared down at the tiny creature in his wife's arms, stroking his finger along her tiny ear and watching her face scrunch up. Of course not. He sat down beside her in the spot Victoria had just vacated. What should we call her? Esther bit her lip, stroking the baby's full head of hair. How would you feel about calling her Harriet? She brought us together, she deserves to have a namesake. He nodded immediately. I agree. She's a good woman. Esther smiled down at her daughter. Harriet Wilson. I like it. Thomas swallowed hard. You can name her Perry. Esther shook her head. I think we'll use that as a middle name, but she should have our name. Harriet Perry Wilson. Thomas blinked quickly to hide the tears that sprang to his eyes. I love you, Esther. More than I ever thought it was possible to love. Do you want to hold her? Thomas shook his head. I'd break her. No you won't. Just make sure you support her head. She carefully placed the baby in Thomas's arms and watched his face light up. He stood, walking her and speaking softly. I'm going to make sure nothing bad ever happens to you, Harriet. There's no little girl in this world who will ever be loved as much as I love you. I just want you to know that it doesn't matter at all who your father is. From today on, I'm your daddy, and I'm going to make sure your life is as good as it can be. Harriet opened her eyes and stared up at him. She looked at the man holding her in his arms, and after a moment, closed them again and settled back to sleep. Thomas held her tightly, knowing that no matter how many children he and Esther had, he would never love any of them more than he loved this one. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Harriet was four months old and they still hadn't heard a thing from Charlie's parents. Esther wasn't sure if they'd given up on finding her or were having a hard time. Harriet was growing fast and brought joy to them every day. The winter wheat was starting to grow again, and Thomas was busy in the fields every day. One Wednesday afternoon Bertha had come over with her children, her tiny son held in her arms. Their new baby was three weeks older than Harriet, and the two mothers laid the babies together on a blanket on the floor. I'm sure they'll be married one day, Esther predicted with a smile. Bertha laughed. I don't think little Timothy could do any better than Harriet. They look really good together. Bertha's five older children were playing outside, her two teenage girls watching the younger children. Thanks for coming to visit today. I was getting a little stir-crazy. Esther had done fine through the winter with the new baby to take care of, but now that spring was upon them, she was having a hard time. It's to be expected. Bertha took a bite of the cookie Esther had made that morning for the visit with the other woman. How are you taking to motherhood? Esther smiled. I had no idea it was possible to love a little person so much. I think I'll have a dozen. I'm sure Thomas will be happy to accommodate you. He loves being a father. It's obvious in everything he says and does. It is. He's a good father, too. I was a little worried when I came out here that he'd resent the baby, but he is as protective of her as I am. 
Esther took a sip of her coffee. Bertha's oldest, Jane, came running into the house. Ma. Come quick. There's a stranger here. There were so few strangers in the area that having one arrive was cause for alarm. The only people they saw were the other families in their church, unless they went into town. Bertha frowned as she stood to go to the door. Esther looked down at the babies and picked up her gun from where it was lying on the shelf above the work table. She had no idea who it was, but if it was a stranger, that meant danger to her. When Esther stepped onto the porch beside Bertha, her heart began beating faster. There, in a fancy carriage, were her in-laws. They'd found her. Take the children and go in with the babies, Esther whispered. Bertha looked at the gun in Esther's hand and obeyed immediately. Children, inside. She didn't know what was happening, but she wasn't about to stand there and find out when her children were in danger. Mr. and Mrs. Perry climbed down from the wagon, looking at Esther. Mrs. Perry folded her arms across her chest, glaring. You had a child and you weren't going to tell us. Our grandchild. Esther nodded. I did. You made it clear I wasn't good enough to be your daughter-in-law, so I was certain I wasn't good enough to have your grandchild. Why would I stick around for you to reject the baby? Mr. Perry glared down at his wife. Just like I told you. With the way you treated her, she had a right to leave and keep that baby from us. Esther was surprised at Charlie's father taking her side. He always agreed with everything his wife said. Mrs. Perry looked at her husband and then at Esther, tears in her eyes. I won't hurt him. I just want to hold him. Just once. Esther bit her lip. Was the woman being sincere? Or was she planning on running off with the baby? It's a girl. Her name is Harriet. You should have named her Charlotte after Charlie. Mrs. Perry bit her lip as soon as she said the words. Harriet is a fine name, Mr. Perry argued. May we see her, Esther? I'd like to see my granddaughter. She's all we have left of our son. His eyes pleaded with her to agree. Esther nodded briefly, the gun still in her hand. Come inside. She opened the door wide for the couple, and they went to the two babies lying on the floor. Bertha met Esther's eyes, and Esther nodded. It was then that Esther realized Bertha's second oldest daughter, Rose, wasn't there. She must have run for Thomas. Even though Esther believed the Perrys were sincere, she was glad to know Thomas was on his way. Mrs. Perry stood looking at the two infants. Twins? No, ma'am. She bent down and picked up Harriet. The other baby belongs to my friend Bertha. Mrs. Perry stepped closer, peering down at the baby. She has blonde hair like Charlie did. Esther smiled. She was identical to Esther except for her hair which was obviously her father's. Yes, she does. She forced herself to ask, would you like to hold her? Mrs. Perry nodded, her eyes glued to the baby in Esther's arms. She held her tightly, tears rolling down her face. She's beautiful. Esther smiled. She's a good baby, too. She's only four months old and she already sleeps through the night. Thank you for letting us see her, Mr. Perry told her. I know you weren't treated well by us, but please know I've always considered you a daughter. By us, he meant Mrs. Perry, and all three of them knew it. Will you write to us and let us know how she's doing? Mrs. Perry asked. Please? Esther nodded. Of course I will. If you want to be part of her life, you can. From a distance, she added in her head. The door slammed open and Thomas entered the house, out of breath from sprinting across the fields. Esther smiled at him and held her hand out to him. Thomas, these are my former in-laws, Mr. and Mrs. Perry. This is my husband, Thomas. Mr. Perry pulled his eyes off the baby and turned to Thomas. I owe you my thanks for being a good father to my granddaughter and a good husband to my daughter. 
I can see they're both happy and well cared for. Thomas nodded, still out of breath. They're my family now. Yes, they are. He held his hand out to shake Thomas's. Thomas swallowed hard, relieved that the couple was being calm and not trying to run off with his daughter. He wasn't certain what had happened before he got to the house, but Esther looked at peace with Mrs. Perry holding Harriet, and that's all that mattered to him. Esther smiled. Would you like coffee and cookies? I made the cookies just this morning. Mr. Perry nodded. We'd be grateful. The drive from Lindsborg was long in the rented carriage. Thomas stayed at the house for as long as the older couple was there. By the time they'd left, they all felt more comfortable with one another. I'll write every month with updates on how she's doing, Esther promised. Mrs. Perry had tears streaming down her face as she handed the baby back to Esther. We can come visit sometime? As long as you give us notice and don't just show up on our doorstep, that's fine. Esther didn't hate the couple, but she felt safer now that her baby was in her arms again. We'll give you plenty of notice next time. I promise. Mr. Perry shook hands with Thomas and thanked him again. Once the door closed behind them, Esther sank into a chair, shaking. I'm so glad they're gone. Thomas laughed. So am I. It wasn't nearly as bad as we'd expected, though. Esther stared down at the baby in her arms. Her wide blue eyes looked back at her and she gurgled happily. Bertha and her children had left an hour before, so the couple was very much alone with their child. Are you sure they won't be back? Thomas asked. I don't think so. I think Mr. Perry has finally learned to stand up to his wife. Esther sighed. I feel like a huge weight has been lifted off my shoulders, and I'm allowed to really be happy now. Thomas nodded. You deserve to be happy. You make me happy. You and little Harriet make me the happiest woman alive. Thomas pulled her into his embrace. I'm so glad you took a chance on a homesteader in the middle of Kansas. Esther nodded. I am, too. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. After the baby was in bed that evening, Esther sat down at the table to write Harriet a letter. Dear Harriet, I'm so happy to hear your news. I'm glad everything worked out for you in Washington. You'll have to bring your husband and come visit again. I know I won't be able to drag Thomas away from his fields to go see you. I miss you so much. I've never had a friend quite like you. Little Harriet is growing like a weed. I can't believe how big she's gotten in just four short months. She's already sleeping through the night and keeps us laughing with her antics. I'll write a longer letter next time to catch you up, but I don't want to miss this going out tomorrow. All the best, Esther. She folded the letter and smiled. She was so happy for her friend.